and welcome to Understanding the Latest BJS Data on Identity Theft Victimization, What It Means to Criminal Justice, Policymakers, Victim Service Professionals, and Allied Professionals. This webinar is hosted by the National Identity Theft Victim Assistance Network. Uh, I'm Mary O'Brien, Project Director of the network, and I'll be your host on the call today. Uh, so before we begin, I just wanted to point out a few housekeeping things. Um, ReadyTalk assistants are online right now and will be for the next 30 minutes to help you with any tech issues you might encounter. So feel free to use the chat function if you need to, um, or on their website, um, on their homepage you can call. Uh, there's there's uh, email and, and numbers there too. Um, so, and also please know that this webinar will be recorded and it will be placed online. Uh, the chat window um, will not be uh, captured and placed online though. Um, so the chat window you see on your screen will be how you will ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, and we might hold some of the questions until our Q&A session at the end, but just feel free to ask questions as they arise while you're still thinking of your questions. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to preview our segments to come. So first, uh, BJS statisticians and report authors uh, Erica Harrell and Lynn Langton will be providing background information on the source of the data, and they'll be explaining the key findings related to financial, social, um, and emotional consequences of identity theft and the experiences uh, that, that victims face after um, the crime. So um, your um, in good hands today, Lynn and Erica have uh, a lot of experience uh, in identity theft victimization data. Um, and Lynn is a statistician in the Victimization Statistics Unit at BJS, and so is Erica. Uh, during Lynn's seven years there, she's overseen the collection of data and authored reports on a wide range of topics, including specialized units within law enforcement agencies, women in law enforcement, indigenous defense, uh, hate crime, contact between the police and the public, and victim services. Uh, and of course, she's also been heavily involved in the collection and dissemination of data on, the, on identity theft victimization obtained through the National Crime Victimization Survey, which we'll be talking a lot about, and through two identity theft supplements to NCVS. Um, she's authored multiple reports on identity theft, uh, including in 2007, 2008, um, the report, identity theft reported by households 2005 through 2010, um, and uh, identity theft, um, the, the latest that, that we'll be talking about here. Um, she holds her PhD in Criminology, Law, and Society from the University of Florida. And I mentioned that um, we're also joined by Erica, who's also been a statistician in that unit um, at BJS for nine years. And her research in interests also include identity theft, as well as a lot of other topics, including workplace violence, crime against persons with disabilities, and, and, and more. Um, she received her PhD in criminology from the University of Delaware. So in the final segment of our presentation, we're joined by Eva Casey Velasquez, um, who will offer thoughts on how the data can be used to inform decisions in addressing the needs and rights of identity theft victims, and, and really what this means for you all on the line and, and the next steps um, there. So um, Eva is the President and CEO at the Identity Theft Resource Center, which uh, many of you may be uh, already aware of and, and might be able to, might have used in the past um, for, for their wealth of knowledge. Uh, they have a great website, which I encourage you to check out and, and just like I said, a lot, a lot um, that they can offer. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization which ser directly provides service to victims of identity theft. Um, so Eva previously served as the VP of Operations for the San Diego Better Business Bureau, and she spent 21 years at the San Diego DA's office. Uh, and she, she has a passion for consumer protection and identity theft issues and is always looking to educate the public about these uh, topics. She served as the Chairman of the Consumer Fraud Task Force for 13 years and is past Vice President of the California Consumer Affairs Association. Um, also, she's been featured on CNBC Nightly Business Report, Huffington Post Live, um, and numerous other media outlets and, and been quoted in the media quite heavily as well. So all in all, like I said, you're, you're in very good hands today. So um, as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the first slide there, um, this webinar is hosted by NITVAN. And I'd just like to take just a couple of slides to tell you a bit about the network and who we are and what we do. Um, NITVAN is a national network which began several years ago with funding from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office for Victims of Crime, which is known as OVC. 
So many of you may be familiar with OVC and specifically the Crime Victims Fund, which um, is a rather unique fund which is uh, financed by fines and penalties paid by convicted federal offenders, many of whom are actually identity theft offenders um, rather than through tax dollars. So through OVC, uh, millions of dollars are invested across the country for victim assistance um, and compensation throughout every U.S. state and territory, um, as well as for training, technical assistance, and capacity building programs, which is really what this grant program was created to do. Um, it was designed to build the capacity of service providers um, throughout, the, throughout the country to uh, support victims of identity theft um, and to better improve that service and expand that service. So um, with assistance from the national network that was created through that project, 10 coalitions, and you can see their, their logos there, ha uh, formed across the country several years ago. And the coalitions are engaged in really just creating, enhancing, um, delivering identity theft training and outreach in their, in their states and communities, um, and improving their coalition members' ability to provide service to victims of identity theft. So their coalition members might be um, in law enforcement, victim services, legal assistance, et cetera, multidisciplinary coalitions. Um, so if that interests you, I'd like to encourage you to find out more about us online. There's um, a ton of, of good stuff online. Um, we have a, a calendar that lists all of our training dates, such as the one that you're uh, attending now. Um, and you'll get to see links um, to our member coalitions who you, know, you might find that you have one in your community. Um, and the coalitions all do very interesting different things. Uh, they're geographically diverse, of course, but they're also diverse in terms of the identity theft focus that they've taken on. So some of the coalitions are focusing on senior identity theft issues, some on um, domestic violence context of identity theft um, as, a, as a method of power and control, um, some on uh, foster care and children identity theft issues. Uh, so very interesting things, and I encourage you to, to come online and learn more. Also online we have tools specifically for advocates um, and for, for victims themselves, but really the network is, is here to, to sort of promote um, uh, training and opportunities for advocates to learn more about serving these types of victims. So on our page we have a resource map. It's a clickable map where you can learn all about the um, state victim resources, uh, including agencies that, that say that they do provide service to identity theft victims, and you can get numbers and links to those, as well as you can learn about for every state um, uh, in the union, you can learn about what your, your applicable identity theft laws are. So this is very helpful for learning if you have a mandatory police report that needs to be taken in your, in your state and, and what that law says, um, links to those laws, as well as just other related laws um, about data breaches and, and how that needs to be reported and, and all of that. Um, so you can really find a lot of information on that resource map. And then finally, we have uh, an online toolkit which is really um, where we have all of the materials that the coalitions have been making and have made in the past, um, PSA scripts, uh, all of their outreach materials, as well as downloadable PowerPoints. So for instance, uh, the Texas Coalition made an entire presentation for mental health providers to explain to them um, how to serve victims who really have experienced trauma from very severe types of identity theft um, that, might, that might have very big emotional impacts and, and that sort of thing. So that's just one example of, of a, a whole curriculum uh, that's online that's ready to download and ready to use, um, as well as sample MOUs, ready to use forms, and, and just lots of, lots of goodies and tips um, as well on that toolkit. So come online and find us. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over first to, to Erica and Lynn. There we go. All right. Thank you, Mary. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we share some of the key findings from our recent BJS survey on identity theft victimization. I'm Lynn Langton, BJS statistician, and I'm going to start out by giving some background on the data and general findings, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Erica Harrell, to discuss what we know about victim experiences with identity theft. For those who are not familiar with BJS, I want to start by just giving some brief background on our agency and the source for the data, the National Crime Victimization Survey. As you see on this slide, BJS is the independent statistical arm of the U.S. Department of Justice. The mission of the agency is to collect, analyze, publish, and disseminate information on crime and criminal offenders, victims of crime, and the operation of justice systems at all levels of government.
The flagship survey for BJS is the National Crime Victimization Survey. The NCVS is a self-report survey that began in 1973 and has been continuously collecting data ever since. It's a very large survey that's conducted for BJS by the U.S. Census Bureau. In 2012, over 160,000 people were interviewed with an 87% response rate. And if you're familiar with survey research at all, this is a strikingly high response rate compared to other surveys you might hear about. And this is largely due to the fact that households in the NCVS are in sample for three and a half years and they're interviewed every six months. The first interview is typically conducted in person and then subsequent interviews are conducted over the phone once a relationship is established between the interviewer and the respondent. Now one of the key purposes of the NCVS is to measure crime that is not reported to police or what we call the dark figure of crime. So official crime statistics that you get from the FBI and law enforcement agencies will tell you about crimes that are reported to the police. But with crimes like identity theft that are frequently not reported, as Erica will discuss shortly, the official statistics really don't give a complete picture. So the NCVS was developed to shed light on those crimes that aren't known to police. The NCVS also collects detailed information on the characteristics of crime victims and criminal incidents, and it provides estimates of the annual level of crime in our country as well as year-to-year -year changes in crime rates. The core NCVS collects data on non-fatal personal crimes, including rape and sexual assault, robbery, aggravated assault, and personal larceny, and simple assault, as well as crimes that are measured at the household level, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and other theft. All persons aged 12 or older in sampled households are interviewed every six months about their experiences with criminal victimization occurring in the prior six months. Now in addition to the core NCBS data collected on a continuous basis, routine supplements are also added to the end of the NCBS interview periodically. And this brings us to the data we're going to be discussing today. The information we'll be talking about comes from the 2012 Identity Theft Supplement to the NCVS. The supplement was developed as a collaborative effort between BJS, the Office for Victims of Crime, the National Institute of Justice, and the Federal Trade Commission. It was fielded from January through June of 2012 to about 70,000 NCVS respondents aged 16 or older. We had a 92% response rate to the supplement. And respondents were asked to report on any identity theft discovered during the 12 months prior to the interview, and then were asked about their experiences with and their reaction to that victimization. Now for the purpose of the supplement, Identity theft is defined as the misuse or attempted misuse of an existing account, like a credit, banking, ATM, PayPal, utilities account. The misuse or attempted misuse of personal information to open a new account, or the misuse of personal information for other fraudulent purposes, like obtaining government benefits, getting medical benefits for tax fraud purposes, or providing false information to police. One thing I want to note before we move into talking about the findings from the 2012 supplement is that you won't see any trend analyses in this presentation. We'll be focusing just on 2012 data. This was actually the second time that we conducted an identity theft supplement to the NCVS, but after the first supplement in 2008, we made some pretty significant changes and improvements to the survey instrument. And because of these changes, the estimates from 2008 are not directly comparable to 2012. So at this point, we won't be talking about changes in identity theft over time. I can tell you, though, that contingent on funding, BJS does plan to conduct the ITS on a routine basis every other year from here out. And actually, the 2014 ITS is in the field as we speak. So we will have the ability to talk about year-to-year -year changes beginning this year. 
And so with that said, we'll jump right into the findings. In 2012, there were 16.6 million victims of identity theft. If you look at the little table at the bottom of this slide, this equates to about 7% of the population age 16 or older experiencing one or more incidents of identity theft. So about 1 in 14 people experienced ID theft in 2012. The vast majority of victims, about 15.3 million people out of the 16.6 .6 million, experienced the misuse of one or more existing accounts. This breaks down to about 3% of the population experiencing the misuse of an existing credit card account, about 3% of persons 16 or older experiencing the misuse of an existing banking account, and less than 1% experiencing the misuse of some other type of account, like a telephone account, an insurance account, or a PayPal account. Also in 2012, about 1.9 million people experienced the misuse of personal information to open a new account or for other fraudulent purposes. And in this category of personal information for other fraud that you see at the bottom of the table here and you'll see repeated throughout the presentation, we have things in this category like the use of a victim's identity to file false tax returns. There were about 225,000 people who experienced tax-related identity theft in 2012. And also things like the use of a person's identity to obtain medical benefits. There were about 160,000 of those victims. So both of those would be included in this bottom category here. Another thing to point out is that you see in this table that the percentages don't sum to 6.7%, the total percentage of the population who experienced ID theft. And this is because, of course, victims could experience more than one type of identity theft, either during a single incident, so if a wallet was stolen and then the perpetrator used the victim's credit card to make purchases and also used his or her driver's license to open a new account. That would be multiple types of identity theft during a single incident or victims could experience multiple types of identity theft during separate incidents occurring at different points in the year. So that's why the percentages don't sum to the total. Now, as you see here, in 2012, about 22% of victims experienced multiple incidents of identity theft. So at different times during the year, the victim experienced unrelated incidents of ID theft. Because we want to be able to tie victim experiences to particular incidents and types of theft, the way the instrument worked is that respondents were first asked whether they experienced different types of identity theft at any point during the prior 12 months. And then for those who experienced more than one incident, we asked what the most recent was, and then all follow-up questions focused on that most recent incident. So basically from here out, everything we'll be discussing is either about the most recent incident that the victim experienced, or for about 78% of victims, the single experience that they, the single incident they experienced during 2012. And so this table here on this slide shows you the distribution of victims by the most recent incident experienced in 2012. Unlike on the previous slide, the percentages do sum to 100%. And you see here that about 40% of victims experienced credit card fraud. About 37% experienced the misuse or attempted misuse of an existing banking account. Again, that's checking, savings, ATM, debit. And then the percentages drop off from there. About 4% of victims experienced the misuse of personal information to open a new account during the most recent incident. And about 7.6%, adding the two bottom lines together, experienced multiple types of identity theft. So again, when Erica is talking to you shortly about victim experiences, just keep in mind that we're focused on the most recent incident of identity theft. And when we're able to disaggregate the findings by type of theft, just like you see in this table, we'll do that so that you see the variations in victim experience across the different types of theft. But for other slides, if we don't have the sample sizes to be able to reliably generate estimates for each of these categories, We've tried to at least separate out victims of credit card fraud from other ID theft victims. 
because the experience of dealing with credit card account misuse in particular tends to be different from the experience of dealing with other types of identity theft. Now, before I turn this over to Erica to get into the meat of the data, I first want to just give you a sense of who the victims are. So you see on this slide, first we see an equal proportion of males and females experiencing identity theft. So unlike a number of other crimes, there's no difference in the risk of victimization based on gender. We do see that, a, that the lowest prevalence of identity theft is among persons ages 16 to 17. And this may be related to opportunity for victimization. So these teenagers potentially have fewer accounts open in their name than an older person might. They may or may not have a driver's license. There's likely just less opportunity for ID theft victimization. Also in 2012, a higher percentage of whites than blacks and Hispanics experienced identity theft. And we also saw that persons in households in the highest NCBS income category, those households with a combined income of $75,000 a year or more, had a higher prevalence of identity theft than persons in lower income households. And I will say that in the report we, re we produced from the data, which is available on the BJS website, we did look at whether these demographic differences held even after looking at just those respondents who had a credit card or who had a banking account. And we found some mixed findings. So for instance, in terms of the racial differences in risk, even when we just select those persons who had credit cards, the differences in the risk for credit card fraud still pers per persist across the racial groups. But when we select those persons who had banking accounts, there were no racial differences in the risk for the misuse of an existing bank account. So I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but I did want to mention that in our report we look a bit more at victim characteristics for those who are interested. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Erica, who is going to get into the details on what we know about victim experiences with ID theft. Thanks, Lynn. For the remainder of this presentation, I will talk about financial loss due to identity theft, problems resulting from the identity theft, emotional distress due to the crime, and the time victims spent resolving financial and credit problems due to identity theft. Next, I'll discuss lifetime prevalence of identity theft, the long-term effects of identity theft, and organizations that victims contact about the crime. And finally, I'll talk about preventative actions that persons take to lessen the likelihood of being an ID theft victim. Looking at how the identity theft was discovered, we found that about a third of ID theft victims knew how their personal information was obtained by the offender. Credit card fraud victims were the least likely to know how their account number was obtained. So when you exclude credit card fraud, the percentage that knew how the offender got their information was 37%. We found that the most common way identity theft victims discovered the crime was by a financial institution contacting them about suspicious activity on their account. The majority of identity theft victims did not know anything about the identity of the offender. Only 9% did. Looking at types of identity theft, 3% of credit card fraud victims 25% of victims of new account fraud, and 23% of victims of personal information fraud knew something about the offender's identity. So again, credit card fraud victims were the least likely to know how their information was obtained and who obtained it, while among victims who had personal information used to open a new account or for other fraudulent purposes, about a quarter of victims had some idea about who had used their information. The identity theft supplement measured various types of financial loss that identity theft victims could potentially suffer. Let me first define these types of loss. Direct loss, which is the majority of the financial loss associated with identity theft, is the monetary amount that the offender actually gets from the theft. Indirect losses are any other costs connected to the identity theft. These include legal fees, bounce check fees, and notary fees. Keep in mind that direct and indirect losses 
include costs that are reimbursed to the victim. Out-of-pocket loss is the cost to the victim as a result of the identity theft that is not reimbursed to the victim. Direct out-of-pocket loss is the amount in cash, goods, and services that the offender takes from the victim that is not reimbursed. As Lynn stated earlier, we're presenting estimates for total ID theft and ID theft excluding credit card fraud because credit card fraud tends to drive everything and masks some of the more serious types of identity theft. Here and at some other points in the presentation, we don't have large enough sample sizes to be able to present the estimates by specific type of ID theft. So we will just present information for overall ID theft and for ID theft excluding credit card fraud. In looking at the victims who have financial, a financial loss of $1 or more in 2012, we found that about 68% of identity theft victims had a direct or indirect loss. Excluding credit card fraud, this percentage was 67%. About 66% of all identity theft victims suffered a, a direct financial loss, meaning that the offender was successful in obtaining goods and services. 14% of ID theft victims experienced an out-of-pocket loss of $1 or more. This is money lost or spent trying to clear up problems that, was that were not reimbursed by a bank or credit card company or other source. Excluding victims of credit card fraud, the percentage that suffered a personal out-of-pocket loss was 18%. Now let's turn to the actual financial losses among those victims who suffered direct, indirect, or out-of-pocket losses. The average financial loss due to identity theft was about $2,200 per incident with a median loss of $300. However, you can see from this table that there was variation in the average and median losses depending on the type of identity theft. Victims of new account fraud lost, on average, about $6,500 per incident with a median of $500. This is compared with the victims whose personal information was used for other fraudulent purposes who lost an average of $21,800 per incident with a median of $1,500. Both of these types of ID theft were associated with higher losses than the misuse of existing accounts. Turning to out-of-pocket loss, again, 14% of identity theft victims suffered a personal financial loss. Among those who experienced this type of loss, about half lost less than $100, while 16% lost $1,000 or more out-of-pocket. When we excluded victims of credit card fraud, we found that 18% experienced an out-of-pocket loss with 45% losing less than $100 and 18% losing $1,000 or more. The total financial loss due to all incidents of identity theft in 2012 was $24.7 billion, which is more than $10 billion more than the losses due to all other NCVS property crimes. Just to be clear, this $24.7 billion includes only those losses that can be measured by the NCBS. So it's not a measure of the total economic impact of identity theft. It does not include losses due to identity theft involving deceased persons or fabricated identities, and it doesn't include identity theft losses experienced by persons under the age of 12, institutionalized, or homeless persons. So if you added all of these other things in, the dollar losses would presumably be higher. In the supplement, we asked victims about the impact the identity theft had on their lives. In the table on this slide, we looked at various problems that identity theft victims could potentially face as a result of the crime. Credit-related problems are problems such as having to correct the same information on a credit report repeatedly or paying higher interest rates. 
Banking problems include problems such as being turned down for a checking account or having checks bounce. Legal problems include being the subject of a lawsuit or, criminal or other criminal proceedings or being arrested. Other problems include being turned down for or losing a job or problems with income taxes. Overall, we found that 6% of all identity theft victims had one or more of the problems shown in, the table, in this table as a result of the crime. When we excluded credit card fraud, the percentage that experienced at least one of these problems was 9%. The table shows the percent of victims that experienced each of the different types of problems. So in the second column, you see that when we excluded credit card fraud, 5% of victims had problems with debt collectors. About 4% had credit-related problems. 3% had banking problems and about 1% experience problems with utilities being cut off, legal problems, or other types of problems. In the Identity Theft Supplement, as well as the core NCBS, we asked about the effect the crime had on the victim's personal lives. First, we asked victims whether the experience of identity theft caused the victims to have significant problems with family members or friends including getting into more arguments or fights than before, not feeling they could trust them as much, or not feeling as close to them as before. We found that 4% of all identity theft victims reported problems with relationships with family or friends due to the crime. Among victims of credit card fraud, 2% reported experiencing relationship problems while about 10% of victims who had personal information used to open a new account or for other fraudulent purposes had these types of problems. Now for context, about 19% of violent crime victims surveyed through the core NCBS experience, reported experiencing relationship problems. We also asked victims whether the experience of identity theft caused problems with their job or schoolwork, or trouble with their boss, coworkers, or peers. About 2% of all identity theft victims reported problems with work or school as a result of the crime. Again, this varied by type of theft with 1% of credit card fraud victims and 6% of personal information misuse victims reporting these types of problems. In contrast, about 12% of violent crime victims experience work or school problems. We also asked crime victims about how much emotional distress they felt as a result of the crime. Overall, about 10% of all identity theft victims experienced severe emotional distress, and 26% experienced moderate emotional distress due to the crime. As we saw on the previous slide, this percentage varied based on the type of identity theft. For victims of existing credit card account fraud, 5% experienced severe emotional distress. For victims who experienced the misuse of personal information for fraudulent purposes, 32% were severely distressed. This is compared to 29% of violent crime victims who reported severe emotional distress. So among certain types of ID theft victims, the percentage that experienced emotional distress was similar to the percent of violent crime victims who reported being severely distressed. Looking at the time spent resolving problems resulting from the identity theft, we found that the majority of ID theft victims had resolved the financial and credit problems at the time of the interview. However, this varied by type of ID theft. 92% of victims of credit card fraud reported that the financial and credit problems were resolved at the time of the interview, compared with 57% of new account fraud victims. We also found that the time spent resolving these problems varied by type of ID theft. Overall, about half of all identity theft victims resolved all problems in a day or less but this ranged from 61% of credit card fraud victims to 36% of victims of multiple types of identity theft. 
On the other end of the spectrum, for about 10% of ID theft victims, more than a month was spent resolving problems resulting from the crime. You can see on this table that victims who experienced the misuse of personal information to open a new account or for other fraudulent purposes were more likely than victims of existing account misuse to spend a month or more resolving problems. 8% of credit card fraud victims and 9% of bank account fraud victims took one month or more to resolve financial and credit problems associated with the crime, compared to 24% of new account fraud victims and 29% of victims of personal account fraud. We also found among identity theft victims, the time spent to resolve financial and credit problems resulting from the crime was related to whether the victim experienced emotional distress and issues with work, school, family, or friends. Victims who spent longer resolving problems were more likely to report distress and work, school, or relationship problems than victims who were able to resolve any issues in a relatively short period of time. About 26% of persons who spent one day or less resolving problems had problems with family and friends, while 14% who spent one month or, or more had these sort of problems. Similarly, 4% of victims who spent one day or less resolving problems felt that the incident was severely distressing while 47% of those who spent one month or more resolving problems felt the incident was severely distressing. Basically, victims who spent more time resolving problems were more likely to suffer from severe emotional distress. The Identity Theft Supplement asked victims about identity theft victimizations discovered during the, pre the previous 12 months but we also wanted to find out about victims who had discovered the ID theft more than a year before they were before, for more than a year before, but were still dealing with the consequences. In order to capture this, we asked all survey respondents, regardless of whether or not they had been a victim during the past year, about whether they had ever experienced ID, ID theft. About 14% of persons aged 16 or older had experienced at least one incident of ID theft during their lifetime. Younger persons ages 16 to 24 had the lowest lifetime prevalence, while 15 to 17% of persons aged 25 to 64 experienced one or more incidents of identity theft during their lifetime. For persons who had experienced ID theft more than a year before the interview, we asked about the long-term effects of identity theft and whether there were resulting problems that persisted at the time of the interview. We discovered that 7% of victims of an identity theft incident that occurred prior to 2012 were still resolving problems more than a year later. This varied by type of identity theft. 3% of credit card fraud victims versus 21% of victims of multiple types of ID theft were still resolving problems more than a year later. Now, going back to victims who experienced ID theft during the past year, we also asked about various organizations that victims contacted about the crime. It's not shown in this table, but the vast majority of victims 86% contacted a credit card company or bank to report the identity theft. This was the most common type of organization that victims turned to. The table here shows some of the other organizations that victims contacted instead of or in addition to a credit card company or bank. About 9% of all identity theft victims, almost 1 in 10 victims, reported the crime to police. However, some victims were more likely to report to police than others. About 23% of victims of new account fraud and 40% of victims who had experienced the misuse of personal information for other, fraud, for other fraudulent purposes reported the crime to police. We also found that 1% of all ID theft victims reported the crime to the FTC. 6% reported it to a credit monitoring agency, and 3% reported the incident to a document issuing agency such as the DMV. 
Just to point out, the exclamation marks you see in this table indicate that the estimate was based on 10 or fewer sample cases. Another 9% another of identity theft victims reported the incident to a credit bureau. When you look at the percent of victims that reported the crime to a credit bureau, you can see that there was also variation here in the likelihood of reporting by type of identity theft. Among victims of new account fraud, 30% reported to a credit bureau, and for victims of personal information fraud, the percentage was 19%. For both of these types of ID theft, victims were more likely to report to a credit bureau than victims of existing account misuse. In addition to asking about types of organizations victims contacted, the ITS also asked about what actions were taken when victims reported the crime to various organizations. Of the victims who contacted a credit bureau, 70% placed a fraud alert on their credit report. About 66% requested a copy of their credit report, and 38% placed a freeze on their credit report. We asked all ITS victims, all ITS respondents, both victims and non-victims, about various actions that one could take in an attempt to reduce the risk of identity theft. The types of actions asked include checking credit reports, changing passwords on financial accounts, purchasing credit monitoring services or identity theft insurance, shredding or destroying documents with personal information, checking bank or credit statements for unfamiliar charges, using computer security software, and purchasing identity theft protection. If the respondent reported engaging in one of these activities, he or she was asked if the action was taken in response to experiencing identity theft. Overall, most persons, about 85% took at least one of these actions in the past year to prevent identity theft. When comparing victims and non-victims, we found that 96% of victims and 84% of non-victims took action to prevent ID theft. While this finding is somewhat counterintuitive, of the 96% of victims who engaged in preventive, preventative actions, we found that 12% took action as a direct result of ID theft. When excluding those persons and looking at just those who engaged in preventative actions independent of any victimization, the percentages of victims and non-victims who took action were the same. This does not mean that preventative actions do not work. We cannot speak to their effectiveness because we do not have all of the information with regards to timing of the preventative actions. But what we do know is that the majority of people are engaging in at least some pre preventative actions, and more research in this area is needed. And actually, one more thing that, this is Lynn again from BJS, one more thing that we don't have in the presentation and isn't in the BJS report that we did want to share with you today in the same section of the identity theft supplement that talks about preventative actions, we also asked all respondents, whether they were a victim or not, if they had experienced a data breach during the past year or had received notification that, they, that their information was exposed during a data breach. And uh, just to give you a sense of the responses there, 6% of all persons 16 or older did say that they were notified that their personal information was exposed in a data breach in 2012. Um, of that 6%, we also asked them whether the notification that they received indicated that their social security number was exposed in the breach, and about 33% reported that they did receive notification that their social security number was involved. So those are just a couple of other statistics that we didn't have up here, but we did ask all respondents about data breaches as well, and given that that's kind of a hot topic right now, we wanted to to mention that as well. Right. And so that concludes the BJS portion of the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eva to discuss more about these finding, what these findings mean from a practical perspective. And then we'll open up the floor for questions. 
Thank you, ladies. I appreciate that. Whoops, let me click back here. Let's get to why this data is really important. Uh, for those of you that don't know about the Identity Theft Resource Center, we have a call center, so we have boots on the ground and we hear from victims. And what we found particularly important about this information was the fact that it was gathered from victims who did not necessarily experience a problem that was long-lasting. So the, these individuals were able, as the data presented, were able to resolve the issue in uh, very little time, less than a day. So they didn't report to law enforcement. We see that they, only one in ten victims reported this crime to law enforcement. And the reality is we really want them to report this. It's still a crime that we need to measure, and I'll get more into that in a little bit. But this actually makes sense when we, when we think about it. Um, the, the importance of this data is that it's capturing people that aren't reaching out to law enforcement or organizations such as myself, and it measures the entire scope of this problem. They've been able to resolve this issue. They don't need assistance. They've got it done. They make one phone call. It has little impact on them. It's not, their information isn't being used in other areas. They don't feel a need to move forward. They don't understand the importance of this crime as a societal problem. They're finished with it. So this data is very important to us, and we applaud BJS for pulling out this information. When we see that only one in ten people are reporting to law enforcement, we realize even more that we need a strong mechanism to both message these consumers about the importance of it and to capture the scope of the problem. Um, the, the new account information, the use of the PII that was pulled out when it's the new account, the one point, I think it was 1.9 million victims, mm -hmm. um, they have a much higher percentage of reporting to law enforcement. And that is stemming directly, we feel, directly from that increased need for additional assistance to resolve the issue. So they are not able to get the closure that these other victims are getting. So they're reporting to law enforcement. They're coming to organizations such as myself, um, such as the FTC. Um, and it's not an, an issue of we've done such a great job of communicating to these victims the importance of uh, reporting this issue so we can get a hold of it. It's that they need help and they need assistance. So we do have our work cut out for us in, in that area. And that was something, that was one of the, the key um, highlights for us that we pulled out and thought was very important. Um, I don't have this on the slide, but one of the things that um, the ladies touched on that I think was important when we were talking about income brackets uh, you know, I, I do think that one of the highlights from the study that we should pay attention to was even though it did, it did show that um, households with the highest income bracket did have a higher prevalence of identity theft, this should not be taken as a reason for those with lower income brackets to think that they should just ignore the dangers of it or that they, they simply aren't um, uh, at risk of becoming victims because from, from what we read there were still a, a very high number, um, over a million victims with confirmed household incomes of less than 24,000 um, annually. So that statistic alone should debunk that myth and I think that's something that we can message to our LMI um, uh, population that you are still at risk and this is something you need to pay attention to. Uh, the, you also covered this, the important distinctions that some of the, even with the, the high prevalence that you did capture, there were still populations that weren't covered. Um, the military in barracks and stationed abroad, deceased, homeless, I believe people, institutionalized people were also not covered. So we realized that there, um, this isn't capturing the total scope of the problem. I also wanted to touch on the different types of identity theft um, and the fact that as you were talking about um, the emotional impact, it, it, the direct correlation between the time to resolve the issue and the impact that it has on the victim and how that, that they're directly correlated. What we have seen here in our center is that those types of identity theft, as you get more into the specialized types and not with the financial identity theft, are the, although there are certainly incidents of financial identity theft that cause that impact. But when we talk about medical, criminal, um, employment, government and tax identity theft, 
they tend to, on a, in a much higher percentage rate, have that kind of severe impact because it takes longer to remediate and because it, it just seems to develop tentacles for these victims. And they are, it, it seems to envelop all facets of their life. And again, it's not something where they call one organization, one entity, like their financial institution, get it resolved in a day, and they're done, and they don't think about it again. So that's where that emotional distress piece comes in again. We strongly feel that there should be a big push in two areas, the, the report and measure. And I know I sound like a, a broken record here, but it, and it, it, this is a cyclical problem in some ways, which, which came first. We talked about how, um, we, well, obviously we aren't getting the public to be aware that this really is a, a, a more of a social issue and they need to be reporting on this and we aren't doing the best we can to get them to report it even though it is not causing them severe trauma. We've already messaged in some ways to some of the folks that need assistance. However, the statistics in this study were showing not much of an increase for the folks that it took longer for. They're still not all reporting to the police. And we really do need a central mechanism that's capturing it so we can get a big picture for all types of identity theft. And that, however, that will not solve the entire problem because as you referred to, the property crime rates in the UCR, the Uniform Crime Report that's issued by the FBI, even as we get as we compel individuals to report this crime so that we can start measuring it accurately and wrap our heads around how much we need to be, how many resources we need to be devoting to this. Once we do that, that's only half the battle because the metrics that the UCR uses to measure these property crime rates, they don't include any of these issues. Those, those property crime rates uh, for larceny theft don't include any types of thefts that are committed by fraud or, or forgery or any of the technology that we have nowadays. Those metrics were chosen uh, in 1930 with one metric, I believe, added in 1979. So we also need to make a push to have that antiquated um, uh, ideology of how we measure crime that needs to be updated as well. So both of those things need to be happen so that need to be happening so that we as advocates can start communicating to the public how important this issue is. I think that again I say this is cyclical because we think that part of the apathy that we have from the public about this crime and it truly is a crime. Um, I think that a lot of this data is disproving the notion that identity theft is a victimless crime. We've seen many of the results here that indicate this has as much of an impact as other uh, types of crimes, including um, assault and, and other violent crimes that, that some of the, these more severe cases can have just as big an impact on the victims. Um, and, and we simply feel that we need to continue to make this, this push to communicate to the, the victims, communicate to the public that the scope of this crime is so large that we need to devote more resources towards that. And as far as victim resources are concerned, because I know that there are many, many people in this area with stretched resources and needing to know, well, where do I send these people? How do we deal with them? This is, part, this is all part of all of our challenges. And you know, I think we need to do a better job and start looking at um, consu more consumer education places. As, as victim advocates, perhaps we can do more partnering with general consumer education and messaging to reach out to our potential victims and start working in, in that way. It's one of the things that, that we're trying to branch out to do and, and keep educating that victim population. But of course, we're, we're certainly um, we want to collaborate with people as well and just see how best we can start making this work and, and again, try to get the big picture out there. And with that, we turn Thanks, it over to Eva. questions. Thanks, <laughs> Eva. Sounds good. Um, so this is Mary again. Um, and we, we do have a few questions that we can take. And feel free, um, while we do them, anybody else who has questions, feel free to chat them on your, your window there. Um, so 
one question I see, and, and I'll offer um, a little bit of information back to it and then turn it over to the other speakers. Um, we have a question about uh, local law enforcement taking reports. Um, so if a crime is committed, let's say in a lot, a lot of cases in these crimes, committed states away from uh, the uh, jurisdiction in which the victim lives in, um, how to encourage law enforcement in that jurisdiction to take reports um, so that the victim's not being bounced um, back and forth between two different um, jurisdictions or jurisdictions so far away that they, they couldn't possibly make the report and that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to add, um, I mentioned earlier the resource map on our website, uh, and just another plug for that, feel free to go to uh, that resource map and look at your local law regarding um, police reporting. So uh, re mandatory reports, whether you have one in your state, and what that says. So in many states, um, they're, they're, the law does require that, that um, the jurisdiction in which the victim lives takes the report. And, and you know, in other states, um, there, there's nuances there. So um, find out how, how that works in your state um, first would, would be a good um, starting point, not that you can necessarily guarantee that that's going to make in reality um, things perfect for victims, but um, at least if, if, you, if you can know the law as a starting point. And then I'll turn it over to the other panelists for um, how, to, how to work, um, I guess, on a, a larger level on getting um, police uh, departments, encouraging them to take reports and how to do education around that. Well, I, I would we love to, to respond to that. that. I, and I would love to respond to that question. Um, and, and my organization actually has a lot of resources on our website. We understand the role that law enforcement plays, and we communicate to the victims that reach out to us what that role is, and that it is really to take the report and get the bad guy, and we will do the hand-holding of the victim. I think one of the key things that we need to help law enforcement jurisdictions with is, and, and if I had the answer and knew how to accomplish this, I would, but I, what I understand is that taking these reports where they really are not going to be able to conduct a thorough investigation and bring them to conclusion, which is the vast majority of these reports, it skews their percentages of resolved cases. And I understand that that can be devastating to these police agencies. And if we could come up with a policy that helps the agencies to be able to take the report so that the victims have it for the purposes that they need it, so that we can capture the scope of the crime, and so that officers are not penalized for, uh, and, complete, and whole jurisdictions are not penalized for not resolving cases where they simply will not have the resources to do it. That is part of the, the equation there. I don't have an answer, but we do understand that's part of the problem. That's good. Um, Lynn and Erica, were you um, wanted to speak back on this? I mean, we, we really can only talk about the data. So I think... Okay, no problem. I just uh, I, I thought I might have heard. That's right. good, yeah. Um, and I did have... Um, so I, I, do, I do have an uh, attendee on the line um, who, who's writing back now, who, is, um, who represents our uh, NITVAN coalition in Colorado, and also is a victim advocate um, for the CBI's. Uh, they, they have a 24-7 um, hotline for victims of identity theft there in Colorado, um, who is encouraging uh, to work with victim advocates. So. Um, uh, you know, if there's if there's somebody on the on the inside that can talk to the officers about taking the report, um, that can be helpful. And I'd also add on to that, uh, advocates can manage the expectation of the victim. So, in a lot of cases, uh, if a victim, you know, thinks that you know uh, taking a report is going to push for uh, prosecution and resolution in that sort of way, um, like Eva, like you said, in a majority of the cases, that's not necessarily going to be the outcome. So being, being clear to manage those expectations can be helpful, and, and an advocate can help with that. Um, but also being able to take that report, because in a lot of cases, and like you mentioned, the report um, opens up to the victim certain rights um, uh, to, uh, towards resolution for them um, that we could talk all about. But um, basically, that just having that report number can really help the victim uh, move forward in, in the practical matters of resolving their case, even if prosecution and all of that is not ever going to happen in, in that, um, that scenario. So um, 
Okay, well I'm going to look at it. We're getting a whole lot of uh, questions now. This is great. Um, okay, so um, let's see here. Can, um, can uh, Lynn or Erica, can you describe a little bit more about how emotional distress was measured um, when we talked about that on those slides? Sure. So we, uh, we developed those questions in collaboration with some researchers that work in the area of uh, PTSD, do some, do some work on determining whether folks have PTSD. Um, and so the question is really pretty simple about the emotional distress. We just basically say how distressing was the misuse or attempted misuse of your personal information to you? Was it not at all distressing, mildly distressing, moderately distressing, or severely distressing? And so of course, it leaves it up to the respondent to, or the victim to interpret what, what each of those categories mean. So you could have some variation in terms of what one person perceives as severely distressing versus what another person perceives as severely distressing. But it is just based on the perception of the victim and how they, what, how they see their, categorize their level of distress. Good. Okay. Um, Another question um, is asking, somebody is asking about medical identity theft and the percentage um, broken down um, of medical identity theft and, and if that was uh, detailed. Um, and just before we get into that, I, I just wanted to um, kind of put it out there that um, this uh, questioner might be interested in uh, the 2013 annual survey on medical identity theft uh, conducted by the Ponemon Institute uh, in, in collaboration with uh, the Medical Identity Fraud Alliance, which NITVAN is, is a, a partner with. Um, so you can, you can access that report, and I can uh, put a link you know, when we finish the, the webinar. If you want to hang on the line there, I can put a link in that chat window before you sign off uh, that will give you more information about that. Um, but do, do Erica, or Lynn, do, do you want to um, talk a little bit more about the medical identity theft, if, if possible? Yeah, we don't have the percentages here in front of us, but no. we, can, we can certainly email and follow up with those. Okay. Actually, that falls under personal information being used for fraudulent purposes. So it's folded in into that specific type of identity theft. We can break it out further, but in the report and what we have in front of us, we just don't, we haven't broken out that percentage. So. Right. Sounds good. And we can uh, follow up with, if, if for folks that have individual questions too, we can follow up with you with your, your email addresses that you took when you registered if you'd like. Um, we, we have somebody asking about a uh, sort of a list of training that law enforcement can attend for identity theft cases uh, to improve knowledge on that. Uh, does anybody want to speak to uh, good sources for training? I'll, uh, I can start. <laughs> um, one, really, um, one really good source for, for training, um, first of all, for advocates, but also uh, could, a, could apply for law enforcement, um, the Office for Victims of Crime, uh, which, which funds our project that I mentioned earlier, if, if you Google that, has a very, very in-depth, um, I be, believe it's 40-hour training, interactive online on uh, identity theft cases. Um, so if, there's, if that's um, something that is available time-wise, that's a great place to, to start. Um, and then also periodically NITVAN of course does, does a, lot of, a lot of trainings. Um, we will be doing coming up in I believe May um, training just an overview on identity theft and how to sort of handle those cases. We've also trained in the past um, uh, with um, NCVC uh, and the FINRA Foundation um, and done sort of overviews that are really good in, in that way. Um, a lot of those are found on our YouTube page, so you can go there, but certainly we're not the, the last word on that. And uh, I know that, Eva, you have a lot of good, good trainings out there too. Um, I will say um, that, we, that we have in the toolkit uh, specific um, links to specific trainings um, for law enforcement officers that you can also find if you go um, to identitytheftnetwork.org. Uh, but um, Eva, do you, do you want to respond to that We too? have resources on our website, and they, we have information that we provide to law enforcement. It, I would like to know what kind of specific training, because I think that there are different facets of that training. Um, I know that different um, jurisdictions and organizations have it's really by jurisdiction, and some of them have excellent resources as far as investigative tools for officers, and some don't. And I have strongly um, seen a need for some kind of centralized 
um, tool for all jurisdictions that conduct these organizations, and I've actually been um, lobbying, for lack of a better word, uh, COPS, which is you know part of DOJ, um, and and hopefully we'll get some, we'll make some traction there. I know there's a need out there. We certainly don't provide um, investigative types of resources, so. Um, can't comment on that. I think it's really jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and it might just be something where a police organization or a statewide police organization might be able to point them in the direction for that. Um, so maybe if they could type back on there what specific type of resources for, um, for law enforcement they're talking about, that would be helpful. That sounds good. Yeah, and we can we can follow up with there. There's a few other um, ones that would be good to answer individually as well. Um, questions um, and de definitely um, for for this questioner, go go online and any others that are interested. Um, roll call videos and all of that that I mentioned. Um, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation earlier um, that hosts um, one of the Identity Theft Coalitions. They've done um, quite a lot of work on that um, too, so that uh, you can kind of find out how to get to those online. And um, any of the folks that want to contact me directly about this issue, I have a passion for it because I did the former investigations in law enforcement. I am happy to beat that drum out there with you guys, so please reach out to me individually. Okay, and I'm going to take um, just, I know we're, we're running a little over, but we're getting a lot of good questions. I'm just going to do two more, but feel free to continue to type yours, and like we said, we'll, we'll try to get back to them um, afterwards if we can. Um, one person asking about research that targets um, the victimization of children uh, below the age of uh, 16 or 17 on identity theft. Um, and uh, Erica or Lynn, are, are you aware of um, research efforts towards that population? Or can you speak to that at all? Uh, I mean, we can speak to the fact, the, the reason that we um, exclude younger populations, well, first of all, in the NCVS, we restrict our sample to persons 12 or older. And there's a lot of reasons for this um, involved with, you know, the cognitive abilities of young children to understand questions the same way adults would, and then ethical um, considerations as well, because we're asking about criminal victimization. Uh, the, for the identity theft supplement, um, after some cognitive testing and some other research, we decided to restrict it to persons 16 or older um, because younger than 16, um, you don't tend to have folks with credit cards of their own, driver's license of their own, and, so, and, and also they just may not be familiar if someone is using uh, their social security number, for example. A younger person may not know or may not have recognized it at that point. Um, in terms of other resources on um, identity theft against children under 12, I know there is some research out there, but uh, on the national level, to my knowledge, there is not, not anything specifically focused on that, that younger group. Um, we are in the process of doing a fairly massive redesign of the NCBS, and you know, one of the things that we're going to be looking at as part of that redesign is our policies about interviewing um, younger children. Yeah. So that's something we'll be looking into a bit more. But at this point in time, to my knowledge, there's nothing, there's no national collection that would provide data on identity theft against kids. We have our own internal stats that we keep on child identity theft from our call center. So we have percentages uh, year over year that I can provide to that individual if they're interested, and we are national. Obviously, we're not, um, you know, as large in scope as, as perhaps what you're looking for. But we do have some statistics. We don't have in-depth, granular research. We just have numbers of the cases that we've helped remediate over the years. Um, and I'll also say too, uh, a, lot, a lot of us probably on this call were participating or attending, um, I think it was last year, uh, a forum on child identity theft that had a lot of great speakers. Um, and uh, we can send that information on, uh, all of that was placed on YouTube. Um, there's just a wealth of information in the crowd that was in that room um, at that forum on child identity theft. Um, NITVAN's also done a webinar on children in the foster care system specifically, um, featuring some folks from the FTC as well as a panel of some of the coalition coordinators in NITVAN who have dealt specifically with this issue in their states and kind of some of the things that they've done in response to that that might be interested, interesting to some of you that, um, that are interested in that subject. So, um, okay, I'm looking at the time. Um, I 
for the rest of the questions. I think we will just try to follow up as best as we can after the webinar. But it's great to see that everybody was so engaged. And I just want to thank um, Eva, Lynn, and Erica once again for, for doing this today. And um, the nearly, I guess, 100 of you that were on the call um, uh, that care enough about the issue to, to take your time to attend today. So um, once again, this will be placed online on our YouTube channel. And uh, the link will also be sent out under, um, after the webinar later on today uh, to let you know about the recording and the slides and all of that. So um, feel free to contact any of us with questions. Here's our contact information on the screen again. Um, and with that, um, I'll just say thanks again, and um, we'll, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks.